As you know, I take over as chair from Andy for the rest of the um, session. Um, can I start with just thanking everybody for their uh, contribution for all uh, attendees. It's really great to see so many people who are my, like of like mind um, coming together to to celebrate the work that is um, that all colleagues are doing. There are a lot of interesting points in the in the chat box. And I will be able to address those at the end. You have 10 minutes for questions at the end. Um, so um, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Ali O'Shea. Ali works with us in the Centre for Public Engagement. And um, Ali is a very experienced health services researcher and has done a lot of work around patient and, and public involvement and engagement. And Ali will speak. Um, about some of her, of her ongoing work and um, and tell a story around patient to you, Ali. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mary, for your introduction. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to my session. Um, as Mary says, I'm Ali, and I'm a researcher in the Centre for Public Engagement. Um, so in posing the question, where is the public voice and public involvement? Um, I'm going to speak a little about our experience and findings from research that we've done exploring patient and public involvement, PPI, in NHS healthcare commissioning. So clinical commissioning groups, CCGs, uh, were formed in 2013 when commissioning powers shifted from the former primary care trusts and since then CCGs have held responsibility for commissioning the majority of hospital and community care services for their local populations. Um, shortly after the introduction of CCGs, back in 2014, early 2014, we began a single case study of patient and public involvement um, in these new structures, um, looking at one CCG. The, um, the context for this study was the increasing recognition over recent years of the importance of PPI in healthcare service development in improving outcomes for service users. And the patient's lived experience has been emphasised as a very valuable component of, of, of PPI. Um, PPI CCGs has been a statutory requirement. When CCGs were formed in 2013, there were stipulations about PPI in, in the work of CCGs. We were um, in particular looking, we were looking at the role of PPI but specifically involvement at a strategic level in commissioning decision making. And we wanted to learn how PPI was experienced by those involved, and that's the, the staff members and by members of the public or, or lay people. So over an 18 month period, we collected data uh, on PPI by observing some of the meetings within the CCG where there was PPI and, uh, and we did interviews with CCG staff members and also with members of public who took part in different meetings, either as public representatives or as simply members of public who attended uh, the board public meetings. But what we found was that involvement was both facilitated and hindered by approaches to PPI. Um, it was facilitated through the CCG's commitment and support. Um, so, for example, um, admin and other staff were allocated to PPI groups. Yes, so as I was saying, so the admin um, and, and other staff were allocated to the PPI groups and also um, at the meeting venues, um, various papers, uh, facilities and refreshments were all provided. But PPI was also hindered by um, well by the limitations around involvement. So the scope for involvement, uh, the type of involvement, the level of involvement and, and so on, all of which was determined by the CCG. Um, I'll say a little more about the hindering aspect shortly. But um, we found we found a hierarchy when it came to capacity to having a voice and to influence the CCG. CCG's work, whereby the professionals, the board members, occupy the top, most powerful positions, as the pyramid shows. 
the hierarchy was a bit complex actually with with some cases overlapping but this is a very general overview um it's interesting i, I noticed that gary earlier mentioned about the possibility of you know the whole thing about hierarchies and sort of moving away from those um and, and beyond beyond hierarchies but um i suppose this was kind of like uh, demonstrating what we found it was like a stratification here and it was really demonstrating who who is really in charge and sort of that, that say the pyramid side of it so at the top the, the two the two categories of ccg board members are the voting and the non-voting members and then there's the ppi group the formal group that worked to support the ccg um, and was also accountable to the ccg but even within this group, um, there was a divide between the staff members who assisted the lay chair in leading the group and then the other lay members of the group who were representatives of uh, various local community groups um, and services, the voluntary sector and, and so on. The staff members um, and lay chair had access to CCG board staff. Um, which sounds a bit strange, but they they might have they sometimes had meetings with them, but that, that those meetings would be away from the rest of the group. And then near the bottom are the members of public who attended the CCG public board meetings, um, and at the very bottom are members of public whose involvement was uh, taking part, um, perhaps in a CCG public consultation, and these tended to be held in, in public places and were often a means of informing people of the CCG's work um, or, and or getting feedback from people about their experiences of, uh, of the services. Um, but uh, yes, but I'd like to say um, a bit about the CCG's public board meetings that members of public attended. Um, as an example really of power imbalances in relation to PPI being hindered. These meetings took place once a month um, and the professionals determined the what, the when, the how members of public could participate in meeting discussions. Um, public input in these meetings tended to be restricted to uh, comments and questions that were deemed relevant uh, to the agenda items and, and, and their voices um, at times were sort of closed down politely, but firmly, if their questions or comments were seen as uh, not relevant, um, too subjective um, or if time was running short. And there's a couple of quotes here from our participants and one member of the public told us that there was a slight tendency to listen to things that fit into their agenda. And if someone raises something pertinent, maybe they should actually be following up on that rather than seeing it as, oh God, that's something else to do and that's another problem you've given us. Um, and another comment was, um, at times meetings didn't feel open to public participation. So if they think it's not a relevant question, they'll close down quite quickly, I think, on the question. Um, and they are very clear of the direction they want to go in and I don't know that they're terribly open to other people. We found that the arrangements around public participation meetings actually changed while we were doing our data collection. So during our um, early on observations of these public meetings, members of public were invited to ask questions and give comments at the end of each agenda. Uh, uh, sorry, agenda item after the board had finished its discussion. Um, a few months further on, this changed to a 10 minute slot at the end of the meeting um, for public participation. But this this wasn't ideal um, because sometimes the members, uh, the public, sorry, the members of public's questions or comments might relate to an item that had been discussed some 30 minutes or so previously. So in a sense, was being raised out of context. Um, but importantly, after discussion on the particular issue had, had, had actually finished. Eventually, during latter observations, public questions and comments were requested to be submitted to the CCG in, in writing and ahead of, of meetings. And these would receive, well, they received priority over verbal questions and comments on the day. Now, the, the written questions and comments 
would be ideally responded to either during the meeting or if there wasn't time, um, then not so ideally in, in writing to the person after the, after the meeting. But this, this actually didn't go down too well for some of the uh, members of public who were taking part. And uh, one of them actually commented that the, uh, the public involvement is confined to 10 minutes at the end of the meeting. I think 10 minutes for people to ask questions is certainly nowhere near long enough. And another one emphasised um, it means all the people here at the board public meeting don't get to hear what others are concerned about and then the board's response. So in a sense, this was diluting the public voice because by members of public not having their questions and comments heard in that public domain, but instead raising their points privately in writing and then often receiving a response also in writing away from the public setting, um, that meant that, that no one else present at the meeting would hear the views of other people, of other members of public, and then have the option of making their contributions. So there was, there was a weakening, if you like, of the public voice from the collective um, very much to the, to the individual. It's, it's important, though, to add that this, this wasn't a deliberate dampening down by the CCG of the public's voice. Um, it, was more, it was more about the board's self-protection or um, a subtle means of controlling the discussion and public involvement. The board was steering the meeting and public input. And when the meeting was, when it was over running time-wise, it was the public slot that got reduced. Um, the overall impression was that, that hearing the public's views was not actually a priority in, in, these, in these types of meetings. More recently, um, commissioning arrangements have been undergoing further change. Um, so in 2016, um, Sustainability and Transformation Partnerships, STPs, were formed uh, with the intention of more collaborative working across health and social care. Um, and by 2021, STPs, it's expected, um, so it's, ex oh, it's expected that every STP uh, will become an integrated care system, an ICS, where, where groups of local NHS organisations um, will work together with each other, with local councils and other partners. Um, as part of the changes, there won't be as many CCGs because the existing CCGs will merge to form fewer um, and larger ones. I mean, there are concerns about all of this and, and as a result, what the changes, what these changes mean for PPI. Um, one of the concerns is that PPI and CCGs has been, as mentioned previously, a statutory requirement, but it appears that STPs and ICSs don't have a statutory, statutory obligation to involve patients in the public. Um, already, there has been found um, to be a lack of PPI in the development of STPs and ICSs, and there are fears that uh, ch changes to commissioning arrangements will have a negative impact on PPI in, in commissioning. Um, so in light, in light of these changing commissioning arrangements and as a next stage on from the previous PPI study, the Centre for Public Engagement um, recently carried out a scoping study, um, a single case study, which was funded by the um, NIHR ARC South London, looking at patient and public involvement during the transition of commissioning arrangements to an STP and ICS. Um, it was a qualitative study with um, interviews carried out mainly with members of public who were involved in PPI, but also a few CCG staff members. Um, the, aim, um, the aim of the study, scoping study, was to learn more about these new structures, to explore how the newly merged CCGs, uh, the STP and the, and the ICS, had engaged with the public during the transition um, and to gain some understanding of how PPI might operate in the future. And the study, the study found that um, the involvement of the public wasn't a priority during the transition, 
there was a distinct lack of, of PPI and there were some concerns amongst people who were, were involved in PPI for its, for its future. For example, um, that any focus on PPI in the new structures would be more on short term involvement um, rather than embedding members of the public over longer periods. And there, there appeared to be some uncertainty about what level PPI might function at um, and questions around, you know, to what extent will PPI continue or even develop? Will PPI function at the kind of old CCG local level or at the new, larger, broader area level, which could then make it more difficult for PPI to be heard? And what opportunities will there be for PPI in commissioning decision making? So thinking about in policy that the public voice or, or the patient experience is, is central in, in healthcare service development, but, but when it comes to practice, you know, there, is, there is still some work to be done for PPI to be effectively embedded. And in order for the public voice to be strengthened, there have, there have been calls to have clearer lines of accountability in place um, and for the evaluation of PPI because, because without this it's difficult to be certain of what the impact of PPI is and therefore the value and, and, and evaluating PPI would help with this and, and could contribute to narrowing that, that power gap between the professionals and the public. So in terms of um, our next steps, we're currently working on a project also funded by the NIHR Arc South London, which builds on the scoping study and also the previous PPI study and explores PPI in the changing commissioning landscape. So we want to learn how PPI is affected by um, changes in commissioning structures, what PPI looks like, and what the future plans are, and importantly, how, how impactful PPI is or can be in influencing decision making. So I've come to the end of my, my bit, my presentation, and thank you all very much for listening. If it's okay, I would now like to introduce Dr. Stan Papalau from the, um, who, who works uh, with me in the, the London Arc, and we are doing this um, conference in partnership with our colleagues at the um, South London Arc. Um, Stan uh, also uh, works with the Service Users Research Enterprise um, at the Institute of Psychiatry um, and Neuroscience at King's College um, London. So um, Stan can speak from two different perspectives which um, I am sure she will highlight as she goes through her presentation. So um, thank you, Stan, and over to you. Uh, thanks, Mary. Um, thank you indeed for inviting me to the uh, conference of the Centre for Public Engagement, uh, which I'm delighted to participate in. So um, hi, everybody. Uh, the two perspectives that um, uh, Mary is talking about uh, are these of the, the academic and the service user. Uh, our unit, sure, the service user research enterprise uh, employs for the most part people with experience of uh, having used mental health services, a diagnosis uh, or experience of living in some uh, distress, uh, which we use as a tool for our work. But in my case, I prefer also to identify as a broken academic by which I mean that the brokenness in question is in part a result of academia, a result of, in other words, um, the conditions of employment in academic work, um, which revolve around uh, intensification of performance management on the one hand and intensification of precarity on the other. And so I'm very, very interested in looking at performance management and precarity, and I'm gonna bring this lens here with me today um, to this uh, to this work. So um, 
I'm going to be talking about a previous project, uh, which uh, I finished about a couple of years ago. Um, and this is kind of uh, working, um, it's complementary, I guess, to my colleague Ali, whereas, uh, but whereas she's working with commissioning, I'm working in PPI and research. Um, and I, the sample I have is, is very small, but I'm interested, um, not in the specifics of this sample, but what it might tell us about the structure of, of meetings. Um, and I'm starting with a, a place at the table because team meetings are indispensable elements of collaborative scientific and health research. Um, and um, in addition, the steering committee or advisory group remains arguably the most common site for patient public involvement, PPI. But the dynamics of meetings and their role in embedding PPI in research or not remain understudied with some exceptions, uh, just as shown with, by Ali's work in commissioning. While qualitative studies of, of patient public involvement in research routinely include observations of meetings, when it comes to publishing, it is often interviews and the retrospective discussion of meetings which take center stage. And there's a, there are a number of issues about that, um, around that. Um, and one of them is about ethnography not having a certain kind of validity or taken in the same way as, shall we say, a thematic analysis of interviews, but that's another story. When studies do focus on the meetings themselves, they often consider these as, as sites for decision making. Now, what I've got here are quotes. The one to the left is from my study. The, the one to the right is from another uh, ethnography of uh, PPI and research. And these quotes set up those meetings as a kind of jigsaw. It's an image of uh, different kinds of expertise coming together to produce a, a kind of joint outcome. And I think some of the discussions from Gary today and others have implied, they haven't spoken of a jigsaw, but the implication is that we all bring um, a certain uh, kind of knowledge and the idea is to give space to all these knowledges. Now, I wanted to suggest that for the most part, the jigsaw is in some ways a fantasy um, by which, hang on, oops, ah, and now I discover that it doesn't move. Okay. Oops. Oh yeah, it does move. Um, so that it's a fantasy that obscures what I will concentrate on here, which are the spatial and temporal dynamics organizing research practice. So um, what I'm going to talk about is meetings as um, being constituted, being the kind of system that underpins them is a logic of deliverables. And that the business of meetings, uh, the sort of boringness and mundanity of meetings, what tends to escape attention is the act of rehearsing, repeatedly rehearsing responses to imagined interlocutors, imagined others who are not in the room, but who are overseeing the function of the research project. Um, and this function of meetings is intensified in current funder expectations for multi-partner collaboration and for a set of deliverables. This may be publication, uh, impact on policy, uh, indeed co-production or sustainable partnership with services, with NGOs and increasingly with industry. Now, the study of which this is a part uh, was a comparative ethnography of, of PPI in different projects and different health fields funded by NHR and NHR infrastructure grant. Um, and they all had this kind of common field of aiming to increase self-management capacity in patients with different long term conditions. Uh, the, uh, there were um, projects with uh, in diabetes, for example, in, in mental health and so on. And the question was to look at what are the conditions under which uh, service users, carers, members of the public can make contributions that that make sense, that are seen as legitimate uh, and capable of informing health research practice. But as I said, today I'm going to concentrate on, on a certain aspect of this work, which was the meetings of a steering group in one of those projects overseeing that project as well as a number of small interlinked projects, a work stream in other words. And I'm looking at meetings, importantly, not as sites, as places in which decisions are being made. A lot of studies concentrate in processes of decision making and the idea is to make them more equitable, um, to, or to optimize their effectiveness, to make them more inclusive, more transparent and increase accountability. 
as well as to explore barriers in participation. My focus isn't, isn't sort of to problem solve in this way. My focus is to look at meetings as rituals. And I'm borrowing here from um, the um, ethnography of the anthropology, sorry, of meetings, which was um, kind of set up in many ways or exemplified in many ways by the work of Elizabeth Swartzman on, on, um, on meetings in which she looks at them as ritualized spaces. Uh, common ritualized spaces, which uh, the rituals of which tend to be invisible, to be um, beneath visibility, but which produce and reproduce power relations and systems of control. So I'm not looking at the who, but I'm looking at the what, the kind of structure that holds together uh, a typical research meeting. And in this particular study, I'm talking about a kind of oversight meeting or a steering group meeting, which, as I said, is one of the most common places for a PPI to take place. These meetings in, in my study were monthly in frequency. They, they lasted an hour to an hour and a half. And the purpose was the provide oversight uh, at the beginning uh, over three projects and then eight, which were projects of different design. There were small and they were all interrelated in that they uh, they were meant to support mental health service users in managing their physical health. So, for example, uh, there were interventions to increase um, activity. There were interventions related to substance misuse. Um, there were also uh, uh, quality improvement projects uh, in, in terms of finding ways to integrate reports on physical health within uh, mental health services. The membership, six to ten people, depending on the meeting, uh, all of whom knew each other, were working in adjacent buildings in the uh, research institution. There were researchers and clinical academics um, and sometimes guests from the, the local uh, mental health trust, as well as the lay advisors. The two lay advisors uh, were invited on a quarterly basis, and that was uh, their choice. Uh, so they came every three meetings. They were already known to researchers. They were familiar with research processes and they had a declared interest in physical health management. Now, I'm not going to look at whether they were appropriate or not representative or not, because what I'm looking at is trying to see a slightly different um, space, which is the, the kind of the space of the structure of the meeting. And in the um, in terms of the findings of the themes that we developed uh, through this study of the meeting, there were four main themes, but I'm going to concentrate today on two of them, uh, the first and the second. So um, and here is a contradiction, and that's what is really interesting here. Again, echoing some of the uh, materials we heard about earlier. The contradiction is that on the one hand, these uh, meetings the behaviours and the, the way the interactions in the meetings performed access and inclusion or giving space to the lay advisors. But on the other hand, they took that space away, be in the function of rehearsing responses to imagined others, imagined others who were seen as holding power over the meeting, but who were not present in the meeting. Um, so, to start with performing inclusion, I mean, um, in interviews and throughout the course of the study and um, afterwards, both uh, service user and, uh, and uh, care advisors, by the way, the, the initials here are initials of pseudonyms, uh, which were chosen uh, by them. Uh, by the members themselves. So um, both of them felt included. They felt that it was a friendly, uh, respectful atmosphere, that they could speak, that they contrasted that space favorably um, against other spaces that were uh, tokenistic. So they were very uh, well disposed towards, uh, towards that space and the openness it represented. And that's interesting here. Now, inclusion was set up in the meeting through a number of gestures of giving space to um, to the lay advisors. Uh, there was a PPI item in the agenda. It was also at the end uh, as in Ali's observations, but people were able to speak throughout. Uh, there was attentive listening and all these gestures of respect, nodding and um, having uh, giving space and giving time to the lay contributors. A lot of banter, informality. Um, and and so on, and a lot of exchanges. And also there was explanatory scaffolding, by which I mean 
avoidance of jargon, ongoing clarification, a very benevolent and rather paternalistic explanation of how things are done in, in the NHS trust, for example, or how things are done in research. Um, and also regular project updates and email communications. Here is one of them. Uh, an update, dear W and M, I hope you're both well. Please find the update on our project. So there was a detailed um, uh, kind of stream of communications that went back and forth. Um, so the, there was this kind of performance of, of, of inclusion, which was felt uh, through the kinds of gestures uh, that were opened between the researchers and the lay members, but also through the kinds of communication between them. But at the same time, because the purpose of meetings was to ensure that uh, projects run successfully to completion, meetings were constituted as a site for rehearsing responses to the demands of conjured, imagined uh, others, interlocutors. Actors who were absent, but whose responses had to be anticipated and attended to. The various committees providing ethical oversight, NHS trust managers and frontline workers, as well as members of the scientific community. Much time in each meeting was taken up first by imagining what such partners might demand and then navigating the demands based on senior researchers' previous experience. But ultimately, um, the horizon for all this navigation of demands were the funder expectations for the end of the grant, what I've called here the logic of deliverables. The expectations were codified as sections of the funder annual progress reports. Additionally, within the grant uh, institution itself, there was a complex internal reporting apparatus, which was also installed to ensure that the orientation towards these demands was constant. So there was uh, there were internal reports and external reports, one mirroring the other. So in the early uh, stage of the observations, uh, the, uh, the imagined demands were coming from, um, as I said, uh, frontline workers, ethical, the ethics uh, committee, NHS trust managers. Uh, for example, there were suggestions of how to make the project um, more, um, uh, more implementation friendly um, and by, by uh, joining up kind of services through uh, some of the uh, service improvement uh, tools that were provided. So who to talk to in order to achieve this aim, in order to come closer to this aim. At a later stage, uh, there was a warning against an amendment in the protocol of the project because ethics, that is the research ethics committee, is a can of worms. Don't do that because it'll delay. So there were all these how to navigate the different actors in order to ensure that timelines were preserved and the demands of the funder were being met. So there were all these negotiations. At the latter part of the, of the observations, when the timeline of the grant neared its end, um, the uh, actual sections and the reports, both internal and external, started appearing much more clearly on the agenda items and the minuting of the meetings themselves, which were modelled upon them. And now we see we have the appearance of uh, a requirement to link with industry and a requirement to produce a certain kind of publications and you see them there and so this um so um on one occasion the agenda item on the collaboration with industry which you see there elicited some discomfort from both lay advisors and junior researchers present in the meeting who both expressed reservations on potential involve involvement with pharma for example while such involvement was not in fact undertaken, senior clinicians stepped in to remind others of both funder expectations and policy priorities. And one of them said, you know, it's health and wealth, NHR interested in health and wealth. Uh, and another added, remember, in this grant, you get brownie points for collaboration with industry. So there's a very clear sense of calling to order and of what is important, not because of us and our priorities, but because of all the others to whom we are obligated. In other words, these are the tools of performance management and uh, the sort of, the, if you like, the KPIs for the grant, the key performance indicators, which were invoked as the real um, authorities or uh, the real uh, others who were absent but had ultimate um, oversight. Um, and so what I'm suggesting here, in other words, is that this logic of deliverables, whether they were 
collaboration, future collaborations, publications, um, and so on. This orientation towards imagined funder expectations mediates and constrains the role of PPI in research. So that when we're looking at meetings, we're looking at a staging of a future and how that staging of the future constrains the, the present and in that present, the voices of people constituting it. So, and paradoxically, what I found is that this sense of respectful inclusivity of listening attentively and, and of, of developing um, trust between lay members and researchers was actually not um, material to that logic of deliverables. But on the contrary, it could be used to deflect attention from this constraint. So the place at the table, giving space to others, deflected attention from the pull of the timetable which was nevertheless ordering both participants and, um, and what counted in the end. And I would suggest here that metricizing PPI, so creating more deliverables that this time affect patient public involvement, might further reinforce the pull of the timetable. So I'm not sure that uh, the, the sort of solution for this would be to, uh, to try and create more metrics at this time or more um, deliverables that this time relate to PPI. But instead, I would suggest we need to interrogate that logic or question that logic according to which what happens here is always in the name of something else against which we are um, powerless. And there was also, I can't go into this now, but there was also a certain feigning of powerlessness, a certain sense of parity that was um, developed in the meetings between the researchers and the, uh, and, and the uh, lay members, a certain playfulness, a kind of joking uh, about reports. We can't do anything about the reports. The reports are not really what we are, what we do here. They constrain us. They constrain us alike. We are together in this. And that kind of disavowed the, the fact that the reports were in fact what was structuring the meetings rather than an obstacle to the meetings. So the suggestion here is that within that chorus, um, an intensification of the reporting system um, of the order of deliverables, PPI is the partner out of sync, that there is something in the present that cannot be held in the future in the same way. And the question is, how can we change that? How, is there any way to intervene at that point? Thank you. So now uh, uh, I introduce to you um, Dr. Josephine Upluk, and uh, she will be co-presenting with a colleague, Agnes Angpon, Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Mary. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you. I've not uh, presented uh, at uh, this uh, conference before, um, and I think it's a, a really good opportunity to kind of bring in a range of different perspectives to look at some of these issues about power to the people. Um, and I'm really delighted to be talking uh, to be presenting with with Agnes and, and I'm sure she's going to be uh, raising some really important issues from her blog about why black women are not engaging in research. Uh, so um, I am both a researcher and I call myself a harmed patient activist. Um, and I'm going to be um, talking about issues from both those perspectives and how they come together. Um, and um, I, I also kind of, um, I decided that I didn't really want to specifically talk about some research projects. I wanted to talk more generally and to give more a bit more of a bit of an overview about my feelings about involvement in research and service delivery at this time. Um, this is a picture of me that was taken more than 20 years ago. Um, and the reason I've put this picture up is because I kind of, when I was thinking about this topic, did a little bit of a trip down memory lane to try and remind myself of what brought me to this issue. And this picture was taken when I was working in Tower Hamlets straight out of university. Um, and I was working um, in a, a, a community organisation uh, which was funded by Ken Livingstone's uh, GLC. 
Um, and, and, and that was when funding was kind of targeted towards community groups to give those with direct experience of the issues more of a say. And one of the things that jumped out for me in my work in this organisation, and we were la largely working with black and minority ethnic communities who were very marginalised, people from Bangladeshi, Somali communities, African Caribbean communities. And one of the things that came out from my work with, with these groups is that these groups uh, and communities were often not getting access to the services they needed or getting um, poor services or being harmed by services. And often this was happening because of uh, racism and discrimination in service delivery. And so this was kind of an early, uh, this, this for me was an, an early understanding of how important it was um, in thinking about giving people a voice to kind of understand uh, where some of these communities were coming from. And um, these were communities, um, because their needs were not being met, um, the, 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 they were having to set up their own organisations to make sure that their needs could be met in a proper way. So moving on to my next slide, um, some of the um, of that, that thinking um, began to be kind of consolidated and began to motivate my work when I moved into social work and I became a, a, a lecturer in social work. And some of the early critiques that began to influence me were things like, you know, why is social work pathologizing the poor as responsible for their own poverty? So there was almost this feeling that we are kind of blaming and stigmatizing the users of of services when those people were really using services because they had faced discrimination and inequality in society. And at this time as well, in the kind of late 80s and 90s, we also began to get a kind of bottom-up challenge from a range of excluded groups, Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, LB, LGBTQ groups, those with disabilities, older people. So a sense of social movements and I think this is one of the things that we've started to get, that when these social movements started to challenge services, they were challenging issues about poor care, care that excluded these groups, care that discriminated against these groups, care that pathologized these groups, um, and that is why it was, and, and care that harmed these groups, and that, it, that is why it was so important to work with these groups um, in delivering care differently. And so many of these uh, critiques began to highlight, highlight the individual individualizing of social problems, rather than looking at some of these issues as rooted in wider structural inequalities in society. And so in the work that we were doing in social work, and I used to teach in this um, area, uh, we be began to talk much more about the need to challenge, because it's almost as if we're not allowed to talk about challenging anymore but the need to challenge oppressive practice and work in respect to empowering individuals and communities. So um, this slide um, highlights a newspaper article that told my, my story in 2008. Um, and it was telling my story of how I had a personal experience of medical harm in which my daughter died um, of medical negligence. Mm -hmm casting me into a situation when I, where I found myself on the other side of the fence. So I went from being someone who'd been actively um, uh, uh, interested and, and fundamentally affected by the need to work with communities to finding myself um, in effect um, a, a harmed patient. And, and I found myself trying to get involved um, as a parent um, because I had lost my child to medical negligence. And what I found when I moved out of social care into health care is that for me there was a very different way, I felt there was a very different way of looking at the issues of involvement to what I had been used to in social work. So first of all, as a black woman, I found that when I first used the term BME, someone actually asked me, did it mean biomedical? 
And I had these sorts of experiences over and over again. And so in effect, as a harmed patient, I found myself negatively labelled and stereotyped because I'd had a poor experience of healthcare. Like many individuals and, and even communities who faced uh, uh, discrimination um, and, and have been denied services, I was treated as an undeserving victim. And therefore, the message to me was that we're not going to involve you um, in, in, in our systems. Um, I faced a lot of hostility because uh, my views challenged orthodox thinking. And you know what? There was nothing particularly radical about my thinking. I was really drawing upon some of these ideas about harm, bottom up social movements, how people had been excluded because of health inequalities and discrimination. But all of this seemed to be very challenging, particularly in a world where PPI looked very different to the context in which I had come from. My face did not fit as a black woman. And, you know, at that point, um, my, my career in social work had been destroyed because of what had happened to me um, with the loss of my daughter. And I found myself trying to get involved with no support, no reimbursement for time or expenses, no induction or training or support. And, and then often that kind of negative labelling uh, because um, I didn't seem to fit. And so um, as I began to, um, to think about this, I began to think about myself as someone who was standing at the back of the bus. And I don't know um, if, you know, people will remember um, what happened with Rosa Parks in the civil rights movement in the 60s, um, when, you know, in the late 50s, 60s, where black people were expected to give up their seat and go to the back of the bus because of discrimination. And Rosa Parks got on the bus and sat down and refused to do this. And I started to feel like this. I started to feel that in circles which were predominantly white, I was being expected to constantly stand at the back of the bus in as a black woman and not have a, a voice, to have space and to have leadership. And when I once talked about this at a conference, I was particularly moved when a a uh, mental health service user, as she described herself, who was white, she came running up to me and she hugged me and she said, oh, thank you for talking about us standing at the back of the bus all the time. And it really moved me because I realised that there are a lot of groups who see themselves as standing at the back of the bus in terms of involvement because they are not empowered and given a space to have their say, to have their voice and to have uh, any leadership. So uh, in 2016, I published this paper from tokenism to empowerment, progressing patient and public involvement in healthcare improvement. Um, this went on to be downloaded many, many times, I think almost 50,000 times now. And um, the centerpiece for this was about the lack of equality and diversity, the way that we'd lost, lost the bottom-up approaches, the understanding of social movements, what has actually driven the patient and public involvement agenda, which had now ended up as very mechanistic, very top-down, very tick box, and really wasn't controlled by the people and the movements who'd fought to get a greater say in health and social care delivery and research. And I'd really started to write about these things as a harmed patient, um, fighting for justice for my daughter, who then went on to do a PhD in patient safety and to get involved in academia. I, I, I have now written a number of articles, but actually I'm still on a fixed term contract. Um, and some of the issues that I face uh, that I faced and still face um, as a black woman trying to, to get involved as a harm patient, I face some of those issues as well in academia as a black researcher, um, because there are so few of us who are able to get into senior positions. So I think it is really important that when we're thinking about developing this new agenda, we need to make equality, diversity and inclusion absolutely central to our models of patient and public involvement. We need to take into account 
uh, some of these uh, issues and experiences with the groups from the protected characteristics. And I feel because there is legislation around this that shows that these groups face deeply embedded discrimination in society. And yet often we don't have uh, uh, people from these groups around the table. And I don't think this is particularly radical, but this is something that I've ended up saying, and I've often actually found myself stigmatised for saying it, or I've found myself the only one who has to say it. And this is 22 years after I first started saying this when I started my work in Tower Hamlets. So um, COVID-19 has brought some of these health inequalities uh, in, to the fore. And yet for many of us, of course, we've always known about these health inequalities, particularly groups who've been affected. We've known this, we've tried to talk about this, and we often haven't been listened to. And so we know that these stark uh, disparities, you know, particularly for BAME communities, disabled people, those on lower incomes, those living in the most deprived areas, care home residents, um, men, in, in, in some men, uh, those in the poorest health, you know, this is where um, we're seeing the disparities in, in mortality. And we know that people from a black ethnic and, and minority ethnic background uh, have been seen as at the greatest risk of death involving uh, COVID-19. And, you know, in June, the ONS said black men are three times more likely than, than white men to die and black women twice as likely to die as, as white women. And yet how often will we see a black man at the table in a leadership position in terms of involvement? And this often happens as well as with black women. And how often are we seeing um, disabled people who are at the forefront and black disabled people who are at the forefront and all of those different uh, intersections around the protected characteristics. And so what we've ended up doing um, is, is we've created a very, very narrow um, type of involvement um, that doesn't involve most of the population. Uh, because the groups that I've just talked about who are most likely to be affected by COVID are often the least likely to be involved in the design and implementation of research. And this reflects wider patterns of public sector involvement, which show that those most likely to be involved are older, from white ethnic groups and higher so socioeconomic backgrounds. And this context exists despite long-standing calls for more equal partnership models to involve diverse groups in research, health and care delivery. So this call has been around for a very long time. So at the beginning of this year, um, I, I published this paper, Being Heard, Not Seldom Heard, because I was so frustrated at going to conferences and repeating the same things over and over. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about is the way that we need to think about some of these issues in terms of these structures, that patient and public involvement is not something that you just do on an individual basis. In research, you need to think about the unequal structures that make it difficult to have proper, collaborative, participatory research um, with, with, with the public service users and carers. And you also need to take on board groups of people within the research community, researchers who are most likely to be disenfranchised. Black researchers, BAME researchers, are really at the very bottom of the pile in terms of research institutions. We don't hold the grants, we don't have the power, and there'll be other groups uh, who are like that as well. So uh, really, in terms of general thoughts, um, like I said, I think that we need to start with the structures of our organisations and our work. It's no point just handpicking a couple of people, you know, who, who to sit on a committee. We have to look at the boards and how those boards uh, represent communities. There's no point when we're trying to think about diversity, trying to recruit by sending a couple of flyers out to organisations without genuinely involving them in, in, in partnership. And if we, if, we, if we think about grants, for example, 
how do we build people properly into the grants so that so that communities and members of the public are not exploited? And of course, then we need to think about publications and how do we make sure that groups who are seldom heard get to be um, firmly recognised in those publications. Um, and, you know, while I'm giving my presentation, I've just done a little thing, uh, just had a quick look at the chat. And I have to say apologies because I'm getting emotional. I've seen someone say they're getting emotional. I'm getting emotional because I think that some of these issues, they are emotional because they're about real people's lives and they're about our pain and they're about how we get excluded and then further harmed and damaged by systems who say, that they are including us. So we need to make these conversations about equality, diversity, exclusion, discrimination, central to all of our discussions. We've got to deal with the power imbalances. We can't just talk about it. We've got to deal with the power about imbalances. How often are people with disabilities, black people, LGBT people, actually able to talk freely and have those conversations about their discrimination without feeling shut down. We need to make sure that the public can have an impact on decisions and research outcomes. It can't be tokenistic. We've got to be building those trusting relationships. We can't just keep going out to communities where there's research fatigue because we keep asking people. We keep talking about issues, but we don't act upon what they, they tell us. And, you know, we need to pay just, people, re reimburse people for their time. And lastly, just moving on to the last sorry, slide. Sorry, um, it's, it's Mary. Sorry, just moving is, on to the last slide. Yeah, just moving on to the last slide. Um, we're setting up a COVID research panel to try and get that involvement in the COVID research that's being generated. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Um, so my name is Agnes Atipong and I'm the engagement lead at Best Beginnings. Um, I'm also the Maternity Voices Partnership Chair at Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital. Um, I'm the founder of an award called the Glow Mama Awards, which celebrates the achievements of mums on social media. And I'm also a PPI member within the um, maternity um, and perinatal theme at the National Institute of Health Research. In addition to all of this, I'm also a mum of three. Um, with my two youngest being toddlers, so age two and age three. So it's been an interesting time with lockdown, I can definitely say that. Um, so my kind of key area of focus is maternity and perinatal um, health, um, with particular reference to being a, a black woman. And of course, I bring my lived experience as a, a black woman and a mum with, with three children. Um, so what you would have seen on the next slide is a, a print screen of a recent blog that I wrote and that I published, um, had published on the um, National Institute of Health Research ARC um, South London website, just basically talking about um, service user involvement in maternity and perinatal mental health research with a particular focus on why black women are not engaging in research and what can be done to change this. And I know this is a particular reference to maternity care and perinatal care, but there are so many takeaways that within the research community that people need to be um, to be looking at and, and just understanding you know, there is a reason why there is a, a low black engagement. It's not by it's not by accident um, within, within that community. Um, so, you know, why is this? So there is a perception um, deep rooted in well, it's not a perception, it's a reality actually of examples within obstetric research of racism that is it's gone on for uh, you know hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, we can stretch back as far as James Marion Sims, who experimented on black slave women in America without anesthesia to develop the surgical techniques um, to to repair um, obstetric um, fistula. But even when we go as near as 2020, like now as we are in now. Um, there was recently a research fund um, for COVID and BAME communities. Um, and out of a fund of 4.3 million <laughs> um, to, to kind of look into COVID and BAME, I, I believe it was naught pound. I'm, just, I'm, I'm being slow for, for a minute so that can settle in. Zero pounds was awarded to black academic leads, despite black academic leads applying for that fund. 
you know so it, it you know research and, it, and then even if we look at the research teams the same research teams that are saying that they're, they're coming to uh, you know assess our needs and, and look at our needs are their leadership teams um you know reflective of some of the communities that they are trying to reach but just talking about the leadership teams and the research teams and why they're so important for them to be diverse now i remember a few years back um donald trump had this kind of round table meeting and i speak about that in in my blog and it was about maternity care and maternal health and every single person around that table were were men white men discussing maternal maternal health and the women went ballistic as you can imagine like uh, the pictures of that meeting were plastered globally around the world as far from australia to the uk and beyond because people couldn't understand why do we have um you know the president talking about maternal care and maternal health and there's no women represented um but then when we're now looking at black women or women from um you know diverse communities that now goes quiet and it, 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 what i'm trying to explain is that within our communities we look ex exacerbated when we see you know research tables and leadership tables talking about this desire to assist and to help um black women in research and i should say black women but in research in general and they're saying that they want to come into our communities and assist us yet there's nobody within the leadership team and in, and not even leadership team, even within research team often, that actually looks like us. Um, and by default, this reinforces a kind of colonialist hierarchy. Just by default, it's not, um, well, I hope not, it's not that it's a sinister, you know, um, plan for that to happen. But just by default, if you look at that, you have, you know, white researchers, lead researchers, they're getting the funding um, and so forth. And then they're going out and really outsourcing grassroots um, communities, often from seldom heard communities, to now go out there and do that work. Um, and if you look at that, even from just a hierarchical point of view, that doesn't look good for anybody. And within the community, you know, we see this and we we know that this is a problem for us. And a lot of the times you will not get us engaging within that because nobody wants to be a part of that. So what I'm trying to stress is that what needs to be understood is that black mothers and, and I, I don't want to speak for the whole black race, but I would just say in general, we are out there. Yeah, you know? we want to be engaged. And we want to be engaged in a way that leads to actionable outcomes and an uplift in our communities. Why wouldn't we want to? We are the ones that are being harmed at the most degree we've just seen, even with COVID, that is our communities that are mostly impacted. So I need to stress that we really want to. My WhatsApp groups, you know, are popping with people, you know, really talking about how much we need assistance. But what we don't want is to be exploited, right? And is this fear of exploitation that makes us hard to reach because there is a, a, a deep history of that. And I think that really needs to be um, clear. And so the key questions to ask, you know, if we're really now saying that, you know, with everything that's going on this year, we're talking about Black Lives Matter, we're talking about COVID, we're talking about inequalities, we're talking about engagement, you know, these are all really important things. We're talking about it in, in the beginning of a new decade, that's 2020. So we have a lot of time now to actually start getting this right. These are key questions that we need to ask ourselves across the research spectrum. Are our leadership teams reflective of the types of audiences we are trying to reach? What black researchers are we working with on this project? What black networks are we reaching out to and co-producing with? And I'd like to add as equals. Are we funding our partners adequately? And is our approach transactional or relationship led? And how are we collaborating with and amplifying the voices of those who are already doing the grassroots work within the community? Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes. That that was really lovely. Uh, you and Josephine have both highlighted uh, a lot of really important issues. I just put a note in in the chat that as we don't have to go into all of these issues today in detail, it might be useful that we host a series of seminars or podcasts where we can pick up on some of the really important issues that have been highlighted today that we haven't and won't have the time to discuss. Uh, to move forward on our agenda and uh, invite Francesca Taylor uh, to come and do uh, a presentation. Francesca also works with 
better public engagement and, and will tell us a bit about how, how patients produce who hold that particular role. So Francesca, over to you. OK, thank you very much. And um, welcome to this session on introducing the novel role of the physician associate hospital patients. I'm presenting on behalf of the study team, Jonathan Agidi, Raki Chauhan and Zina Ladva from St George's Hospital Trust and Sally Brealy and Rory Drennan, who is myself from the joint faculty. Um, most importantly, um, all those who were involved and engaged in this study, patients, patient representatives, physician associates and hospital staff and the patient research expert group facilitated by Sally Brealy in the Centre for Public Engagement. Physician assistants, known as physician associates in the United Kingdom, are one of many new mid-level practitioner roles being introduced worldwide, advocated by the World Health Organization to address medical workforce shortages. Um, although um, PAs have a 50-year history in the United States, they're a recent introduction to many more countries globally. Small numbers of PAs currently work in NHS acute hospitals in England. However, the numbers will increase substantially from 2020 onwards as a result of government funding for PA education. Studies in England report poor patient recognition and comprehension of the PA role among hospital patients. They're often confused by the title. Its meaning is not immediately obvious and needs explanation. Furthermore, patients can mistakenly perceive PAs to be doctors and express concerns when made aware of the misconception, with the lack of transparency having potential negative implications for patients' trust in the PA role. To prevent confusion and, in a sense, share power so that patients actually have understanding and, and, and uh, informed about this new role, patients considered explanatory information about the role necessary and beneficial. There's also evidence of a positive association between hospital patients' ability to identify clinicians involved in their care and improved patient-clinician communication and patient experience and satisfaction. Explanatory theories suggest reduced psychological stress experienced by the hospitalised patients. No studies, as far as we're aware, have developed an intervention to inform patients about the PA or any other new professional role, nor have there been any studies of interventions developed with patient and public involvement and engagement to introduce any hospital practitioners to patients. Given these evidence gaps, our study addressed the following research questions. What is the hospital patient preferred method of introducing a PA role? And next, is the preferred method feasible to use, helpful or otherwise, in understanding the PA role and acceptable to hospital patients and PAs? Next. The study was undertaken in two phases, intervention development and feasibility testing, informed by interpretive methodologies. The benefits of this methodological approach were that it allowed for focus on exploration and understanding of patients' preferences for introducing the PA role and their experiences in feasibility testing of the intervention. The aim was to include patient and public involvement and engagement representatives as equal partners with researchers and PAs in the study, using partnership-focused PPIE frameworks as guidance for this approach. Volunteer PPI representatives from the Patient Research Expert Group in the Centre for Public Engagement, facilitated by Sally Breedy, were closely involved in the study design from the outset and participated throughout the study, together with four physician associates working in the study site. Development of the intervention was underpinned by an adapted experience-based co-design approach. Volunteer patients, patient representatives and PAs engaged with study researchers in the design process. First, a workshop was used to generate intervention ideas for introducing PAs to hospital patients. Patient responses to the ideas were then explored qualitatively to enable insights into patients' attitudes and preferences. The six intervention ideas were presented in written and visual form on A4 size paper and to a structured rotated format. The ideas included the PA title and badge and lanyard, 
a standardised script for PAs, two poster designs and two leaflet designs. Uh, 13 adult hospital patients and patient representatives receiving care from a PA participating in the study participated in face-to-face -face interviews in one hospital acute trust. Findings from the interviews were shared by a researcher and discussed and interpreted together with participants in a second workshop. The participants were then facilitated to use the outputs to construct the intervention design. The intervention developed was a two-sided hand size information leaflet with black wording on the yellow background given to the patient with a verbal personal introduction of their choice by the PA and each PA was also to handwrite their name on the leaflet and you can see the two sides of the leaflet there. The second study phase undertaken was feasibility testing. PA participants were asked to use the intervention for each inpatient they attended over a three-week period. 20 adult patients and patient representatives who received the intervention were interviewed to understand the context in which the intervention was used and their experiences of receiving the intervention. Interviews were undertaken in the acute stroke, orthopaedic and surgical oncology units. For five participants, English was a second language. Three PAs were interviewed, one participating PA having withdrawn from the study after phase one due to work pressures. They were asked about their experiences of providing the intervention. The interviews were undertaken in the same acute hospital study site as phase one. Data were coded and analysed thematically, informed by evidence-based guidance for evaluating patient information leaflets. Turning now to the findings, Interestingly, few patient participants reported reading the information leaflet when it was given to them. Most participants described delayed use, putting the leaflet aside and reading it at a later personally appropriate time. For many participants, the personal verbal introduction by the PA before being handed the leaflet was important in facilitating their use of the leaflet. Uh, next, as one patient participant reported, she explained it a little, which is probably why I kept it to read later on. PAs also adapted how they used the intervention, adjusting how and when they introduced themselves in the leaflet to suit their personal style and work context. For example, one PA participant described how they preferred to complete routine patient interactions, such as taking bloods, and return later with the leaflet. Another participant reported introducing themselves at the start of a patient encounter, but not handing over the leaflet until the end of that encounter. The PA participants expressed some initial apprehension about using the intervention, particularly in terms of how patients would respond, but reported that use became easier with practice and on not experiencing rejection. Plaudits were expressed by many patient participants for the leaflet's handy size and card format, making it feasible to retain for reference while an inpatient, and potentially possible to slip into wallet or handbag when leaving the hospital. The colour was considered eye-catching and attention-grabbing, and there were also favourable comments about the concise information in easy-to-read, legible, straightforward language. The dominant communication was that the PA is a new role in the medical team, and what PAs are trained to do and cannot do. Although the leaflet didn't expli explicitly state PAs were not doctors, this was the general understanding. Some patients talked about the PA being a coordinator between the patient and the doctor. Others suggested that the PA role had been introduced to support doctors. As one patient participant said, they seemed to be between the doctors and the actual nursing staff, not quite like a junior doctor. The information also provided reassurance of hospital care and support. Patient participants talked about feeling better informed about who is providing their care and feeling safer in a strange environment. Additionally, the intervention generated anticipation of the informational benefits of the PA, particularly about personal care and treatment, but patient participants were not clear if and how they could personally access the PA for this information. But patient participants wanted more explicit communication of permission to engage with the PA and how they could be contacted if they were interested in finding out more detailed information about the PA role or what the PA could do for them personally, particularly to learn more about their care and treatment. It does need that little bit more information. When do you contact them? How do you contact them? One patient participant reported. 
and PAs themselves suggested patients be facilitated to seek additional information if they wanted. For example, by saying for more information, please ask me. Um, to conclude, a limitation of the study was that workshop participants were not involved in all decision making meetings. Although not planned, some meetings with PA participants and a study researcher took place outside the workshops due to clinician time constraints, challenging the intended more equitable power sharing. However, the adapted experience based co design approach supported development of an intervention tailored to patients' needs and preferences. It was considered feasible to use in the acute hospital setting and acceptable to patients and PAs. Patients appreciated and understood the intervention and it seemed to have the potential to improve their hospital care experience, generating reassurance of care and support in line with the study's theoretical context. The evidence is encouraging supporting future larger scale testing and similar interventions to improve identification and understanding for other new professional roles in hospitals. Um, for more information, um, please do contact us um, about this work. Um, thank you very much. There are so many points and so many comments and such nice feedback in the in the chat um, section um, and I'm going to run the risk of leaving people out um, when I do this, but I was going to suggest something that given as there's been so much really good material here today, really, really, really important points raised. I, I think it suggests to me at least that um, the, the Centre for Public Engagement should consider running a seminar series or a series of Cast or whatever to address some of these issues and it would be good if we could work with people who have raised issues to to formulate program of seminars or podcasts but there were a couple of points that stood out for me uh, and I don't know if uh, it's possible to address them but tomorrow you raised the point at the very beginning um about finance um are you are you still with us tomorrow yeah, yeah. Hi. Have we have we time to just pick that up a bit? Um, Jeremy, are you still with us? Yes, I am. A, a brief discussion about this, please, because I do think it is it is a very important um, issue. And um, tomorrow, I've been in sessions with you before. I think where. Uh, this point has has come up and, and we don't seem to move terribly far with it so it might be useful just to have a, a discussion about that to, to Thanks, kick off ben. with and we spend maybe five minutes or ten minutes or so where people are happy to stay to address a couple of other points okay tomorrow over to you thanks and i, I know that i probably sound like a broken record but the reason why it's sounding like a broken record is because um I, th I think as raised in one of the other um presentations we keep raising this but it doesn't actually get action so um it would be it would be great to get um just a, just a response to this really why why are these um grants not not going to us why are we not being employed by the um teams that are you know that are putting these grants in to include us because you know there's lots of us about that that work within within this area and um you know why do we only have like one two three you know just a few professors that i can think of without without being allowed to um kind of grow and to learn in our our discipline we won't have professors and and doctors and um, even the ones that we do have aren't getting the grant and it's not because they're crap <laughs> you know? so it's just it's sort of back over to you really on that one <laughs> yeah I mean I think it's a really good challenge I'm not sure I know what the answer to it is I think that there's there's a kind of spectrum of challenges uh, and issues at the one end I think ensuring that um, public contributors are paid for the time they contribute to what you might call classic public involvement mm. um, I think is generally done it can still be done better but it's now well recognized as an essential um, and uh, and I think there's, there's still room for improvement but but the, your challenge Tamar is 
is much more fundamental, which is about research culture and about recognizing um, th that um, people with lived experience want to not just <coughs> contribute as volunteers, but to have paid employment, um, um, building on their expertise. And, uh, and I think it's interesting because I think there's a parallel with mental health services where there's been a growing recognition that lived experience workers providing a professional role are an important part of the mix. But I, I suspect research is a bit behind on understanding that, that potential. And in order for research to catch up, it, re it requires different ways of thinking about constructing projects and indeed academic uh, careers and about how you organise research teams. Um, I, I, so I think the challenge is really important. I'm not sure what the answer is. Th I think there's probably something about what funders like NIHR can do by way of providing pressure mm -hmm. or incentives or nudges to the research community to think differently about the public, not only as volunteers, but also as potential employees. Yeah. Um, and, it's probably and also something I, that universities need to do. I don't know the answer, but I think it's a fantastic question. Yeah, I think it's yeah. going to be a number yeah. of things. Yeah. The thing is, we keep giving you answers, which is that basically employ us because it's not it's not that we need to be skilled up, essentially. You know, we exist. We've, we've got professors, we've got people with PhDs. Employ us, you know, create those posts where if you're going to put in a, um, you know, like a research um, grant proposal, um, for involvement, you make sure that that involvement starts within the team that's putting that um, proposal in. So your your PI should either be, um, you know, a lived experience re researcher or it should be done jointly with a lived experience researcher. And there are people who can work at that level, um, you know, not just as a as token <coughs> kind of thing. So the, the challenge or the question is actually, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't we equal? Why aren't you employing us equally? Yeah, it's a good challenge. And I well, thank you. Say, I and that's the answer is. <laughs> but I will certainly take that away. Maybe we should speak off yeah. offline tomorrow, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not yeah. just me. There's papers out there on it. Too. Okay. It, thanks. Some people have their hands up, but we're way over time. Uh, my, 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 my chairing's not the best. Um, so. I go to Stan because I think your hand was up first, Stan, and I can't really see terribly well. So, um, yeah, so thanks. Stan. Thanks. My hand was up, but I wanted to answer in a way to Tamar as well. And thank you very much for your question. So I have two ways of answering. One is um, about involvement and uh, budgeting for PPI in, in grants and in pro grant proposals. And we see that is very, very uneven. PPI is chronically under resourced. Mm -hmm um in whether you're looking at mental health or other health fields and so on in terms of the way nihr funding and calls operate and we can talk about this for quite some time but obviously now is not the time but that's one issue how to allocate time resources and and funding at the beginning because it always arrives late on the scene the other thing that's more to do about research institutions is that at the moment academic work is is almost entirely carried out by fixed term researchers or even hourly paid researchers who or teachers who are working under increased conditions of precarity that is to say exploitation so there is a whole other issue there about what it would mean to have a slice of that pie do you see what i mean without actually challenging the exploitation but rather joining it. Mm -hmm. And the reason there aren't perhaps that many people who can identify as survivors and, and academics at the same time, and I speak for myself here, is that if you are a survivor, chances are you have had an interrupted career, chances are you're not going to survive in academia, right? So in terms of in increasing performance indicators and performance management. So you've got a whole kind of nest of vipers to deal with here. But that's my brief answer. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. 